Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Loretta Young and Joseph Cotton in The Farmer's Daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The other day, I received a visit at the studio from Claire Booth Luce, a lovely and glamorous lady who, in addition to her many other capabilities, recently represented her native state in Congress. And her charming presence made me think of tonight's Lux Radio Theater play, in which another captivating lady makes her way to Washington. It's RKO's refreshing comedy, The Farmer's Daughter, starring Loretta Young in a role ideally tailored for her talents and another box office favorite of this theater, Joseph Cotton. Together, they demonstrate what happens when romance gets mixed up with that great American heritage, the right to vote. Of course, there's another example of romance and voting, and that's the daily preference that women show for Lux Soap. They know that Lux Soap Care is a help to what you might call a, a romance complexion. And here in Hollywood, where screen stars know the value of a lovely skin, the vote is 9 out of 10 for Lux, a trend that I'm sure is nationwide. It's curtain time, and here's the first act of The Farmer's Daughter, starring Loretta Young as Katie Holstrom and Joseph Cotton as Glenn Morley. <laughs> It's late afternoon on election day, as always a very busy day for Mrs. Morley and her son Glenn. Since for decades, the Morley family has been the backbone of politics in Capital City. This year, Glenn has run for re-election to Congress, and it looks like another landslide. Now in the Morley home, he's been visited by a group of newspaper friends. The only point is this, Glenn, that the public goes to the polls and votes exactly the way the machine tells them to vote. You mean that's why I'm being re-elected? Hey, Clancy, where are those sandwiches? Where's that coffee? I'm them now, Mr. Morley. I'm coming. Well, Clancy, how you've changed. Oh, and my name is Catherine Holstrom, Mr. Morley. I am the new maid. Oh, I see. Well, uh, set, set the tray down. Clancy's coffee, Glenn. Oh, no. I made the coffee, miss. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Oh, then I'll have some, please. Now, what were you going to say, darling? Only that the voters won't go on forever believing the kind of baloney that most politicians have been handing out, machine or no machine. Well, I don't mean this change in the voters' attitude is a prairie fire, but... Well, for example, do you remember a fellow named Otto K., uh... uh Schmidlap. Uh, Schmidlap, yes. He was from around Mineral County. Uh, Red Wing County? Uh, may I serve you, please? Oh. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, Red Wing County, yes. He served two terms in Congress, or... Or was it three terms? It was three, Mr. Morley. Coffee, sir. If you're about to say that old Schmidlap was a case of a congressman going down the line for his party, right or wrong, you've got an argument. Oh, the Schmidlap was strictly second-rate, Glenn. Oh, no, sir. Mr. Schmidlap was not second-rate. He was first-rate. With a second-rate party. Boing! <laughs> oh, please excuse me. I didn't oh, well, that's be... quite all right. But what makes you such an authority on Schmidlap? He was our neighbor on the farm. A good neighbor. A good man. Like my father. Well, it's getting late. I think I'll go back to the office and dream up a story. How Glenn Morley looked, felt, and acted upon his re-election to his third term in Congress. Good luck, Glenn. Thank Don't forget to come back, boys. The real celebration's tonight. Jenny, you're not leaving, too. When next you see me, the time will be 7 o'clock, and I'll knock you dead in my new dress. Bye, Doc. Mr. Clancy, did I do all right with the coffee and the sandwiches? Oh, no, maid with no experience. Yeah, I guess you did all right. Good. The employment agency said that if I could work the day out for you, I could work any place. I've been the butler here for 30 years, but it's up to Mrs. Morley if you stay. Oh. Say, how come you wanted this job? I, I need to earn some money. And as soon as I do, I go to the Swedish hospital to become a nurse. Nurse? Yeah. I had money, Mr. Clancy. But yesterday, someone I knew, a man, Adolf Berger, he said he would give me a ride in from Red Wing County. The bus fare is $2.53, so I said, yeah, you bet, I would ride in with him. Uh-huh. And last night on the highway, Mr. Berger's car had an accident. He had no money, and they asked me to loan him. Fine thing. Yeah, but that's not all. We were far from town, and I had to stay overnight at the motel. I don't know where he stayed, but this morning when I asked him about my money, he said no. 
I said, all right, I will get the police. He said, go ahead. And he would tell everybody, my family, the people at the hospital, that I... Well, that, that, that he and I at the hotel and... Why are you telling this to me? Well, because, Mr. Clancy, you are a good man. And I had to tell someone. Uh, wash the dishes, will you? How can yeah. I dry if you don't wash? Yeah, Mr. Clancy. That adult's got a good punch in the nose coming to him. Oh, don't worry. I gave him a good punch on the nose myself, all right. <laughs> I bet you did it that. Yeah. Well, uh... there's the car on the driveway. That means Mrs. Morley's home. Oh. We can meet her in a few minutes. We had a delegation here from the press. Virginia Thatcher, too? Naturally. Did you propose to her? Well, there's no rush about that. Virginia and I have what you might call a understanding. Anyway, where were you? Election headquarters, of course. Well, how's everything going in the 14th for that ward healer, Morley? Oh, Morley's no ward healer. I know the boy well. Wonderful to his mother, they tell me. Unless I miss my guess, he'll be re-elected by the usual majority. Ray for the party. Party my foot. The voters did it themselves. You should have come home sooner. We had coffee, real coffee. Set out for it, huh? Oh, no, it's that new maid, Clancy Hyatt. <laughs> oh, here she is now. What did you say your name is? Uh, Catherine Holst. Oh, this is my mother, Mrs. Morley. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Morley? Mr. Morley thinks you did quite well this afternoon, Catherine. Would you like to work for us? Well, I, I do have to earn some money. Anything wrong with our money? Oh, no. No, I need it so I can start my nursing course. But uh, I would not be permanent for more than about uh, two months. You know, these these days, that's permanent. Now, uh, what can you do? Oh, well, at home, I do everything. I do washing, ironing for Mama, Papa, my three brothers, myself. I clean all seven rooms and I do dishes, of course. Oh, of course. And I help Mama preserve meat, I candle eggs, dill pickles, uh, smoke ham and bacons. And I wait on table, 40 hands at harvest time. Oh, and I, uh, I make glug. Glug? Yeah, at Christmas time, with a hot poker and brandy. You want to know what I do outside? Well, I don't know about my mother, but I'd be fascinated. Well, <laughs> I plow with horse and tractor. I shock wheat, milk cows, bed horses, cut the wood for stove. Catherine, you've got a job. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Morley. And now I help Mr. Clancy prepare for party. <laughs> Glenn has headquarters on the phone, Mrs. Morley. The opposition has conceded. And what did you expect, Mr. Johnson? You're a lucky man to have Glenn Morley as your teammate in Washington. Don't I know it, Nordic? I can tell you how grateful I am to both of you. Well, there's something we mustn't forget. You and Glenn have been elected, Mr. Johnson. But we'll all have to do some fence mending by the time the next election rolls around. Some order, Mrs. Morley. Uh, no, thank you, Captain. You, sir? I believe I will. Uh, tell me, young lady, did you vote today? I couldn't vote, sir. I am not registered in the city yet. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'd have considered a victory, a complete success, if a pretty girl like you had voted our ticket. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. But if I could have voted, I wouldn't have voted for you. Well, now. Well, now, See I... See what I mean, Mr. Johnson? Fence mending. <laughs> morning. Come in. Uh, Mr. Clancy said you liked your breakfast in bed. Yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, oh, this coffee, uh, yours? Yeah. And your morning paper. Yeah. Oh. Oh, don't you like it? Hmm. Uh, your picture in the paper. Oh, do you? Well, it's better than that Mr. Johnson. But say, what is this feud between you and Mr. Johnson? Well, oh, I don't think he has a good heart for the people. Oh, in what way? Well... Why is he against the higher minimum wage? How do you know that he is? Because I heard him on the radio. He said it was up to everyone to look out for himself, and I believe that, too. But I think everyone has a right to a living wage. Well, just what, in your opinion, constitutes a living wage? Well, I... I, I believe the man who said a living wage depends on whether you're getting it or giving it. <laughs> uh... Would, would there be anything else, Mr. Morley? No, no, that's that's quite enough, thank you. Mr. Johnson, why don't you learn to keep your big mouth shut? Good morning, Ma. Oh, wasn't that Katie I just saw going out the door? She's not leaving us. No, she's just going downtown to buy some uniforms. Oh, uh, you sure she knows the way? I wrote the directions down. Oh. Well, uh... I think I'll be getting along. What for? Well, well, I'm supposed to have lunch with the governor. At 10.30? Well, I've got a lot of people to thank, you know. Breakfast go all right? 
Oh, superbly, Clancy. Yeah, I sort of figured it would. Hop in, Katie. I'll oh. save you ten cents bus fare. Oh. <laughs> the last time I saved bus fare, it, it cost me $75. You must tell me the story of your life sometime. I will, Mr. Morley. Sometime. By the way, uh, what kind of uniforms are you getting? Oh, Mr. Clancy said something very plain. Oh, well, Mr. Clancy has no imagination. I, I think I'd better help you pick them out. Quite a large package, Katie. How many uniforms did you get? Uh, I- I'm afraid there are 12, Mrs. Morley. Exactly what I ordered. 12? Let's see. Two blue, two black, two gray, two maroon, and four simply charming informal numbers for housework in the pre-luncheon periods. And who's going to pay for all these, Mr. Moneybags? It's your house, Ma. Just write them off as overhead. I sure feel like a tramp in my old blue serge. <laughs> Hmm? Your mother, what did the doctor say? Oh, nothing serious, just a head cold. She'll probably be all right tomorrow. Oh, good. Then it will be all right for me to speak to her. Hmm? What about? Well, I've been in this house for six weeks, Mr. Morley. I have saved enough money. What are you talking about? My nursing. Oh, well, I thought you'd forgotten all about that. Oh, no. Well, uh, aren't you happy here? Yeah. Is the uh, work too much for oh, you? Oh, no, no, there's uh-huh. nothing wrong. Want more time off? Or... No, I just want to be a nurse. Oh, well, if you want to be a nurse, there's a very sick woman down the hall who needs you. Oh, someone besides your mother? Well, you know perfectly well that a cold can lead to something very much worse. It can easily turn into... Well, if if, if you're leaving us, uh, you're leaving us. I am sorry, Mr. Morley. I have been very happy here. You certainly seem in an awful hurry. You, you mean now or in general? Oh. Well, uh, today is my day off. Uh, where are you going? Uh, skating. The pond in back of the house. The ice looks very good. Well, I hope you have a good time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morley. Uh, I always do. Come in, come in. This just came a tele... Well, look at you going ice skating, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I just asked. Well, if she's leaving... Uh, I mean, if I'm leaving for Washington after New Year's, what chance will I have... Well, give me the telegram. Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? I'm leaving for Europe tonight. You what? Well, telegram. Come on, let's tell Ma. Wait a minute, then. Say that all over again. Well, here, read the wire. I'm leaving for Europe tonight. In that outfit? Skating all the way, are you? <laughs> yeah. Let's see, House Subcommittee on United Nations Economic Planning. What time are you leaving? I'll see if I can get a plane to New York right after dinner. Virginia's coming to dinner. Had her phone to come early. Uh, a caller for me, Clancy. I've got to get some exercise. Uh, just be careful. Remember, you're no kid anymore. You realize, of course, you're talking to the captain of the greatest hockey team Yale ever had? Uh-huh. Well? Clancy, push a chair over the window. This I want to watch. If you've got a cold, you... Hand me that quilt and stop worrying. Say, that that's Katie out there, isn't it? Well, so it is. What's she running for? She claims that running keeps her in shape for skating, and skating keeps her in condition for running. It's a vicious circle. Aha! Uh-huh. There's our captain. Oh, there seems to be a discussion out there. Is Katie going to skate, or is Glenn going to run? Glenn is going to run. Poor boy. He won't last a lap. You you are not going to run anymore, Mr. Morley? Uh, I I think I'll skate now and limber up afterwards. Oh. Uh, Put on your skates, huh? I'll give you a few pointers. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morley, are you really going to Europe tonight? Uh, Of course. But if you're so worried about your mother... Oh, she'll be all right. I I was just trying to think of some way to make you stay. Oh. Would it make you happier if I stayed until you got back? Would I? Well, I mean, yes. Yes, I would. All right, I stay. I I was just trying to think of a good reason to stay. (laughs) Well, my skates are on. Good. Now, take my hand. Oh, no, no. No, first I show you how I skate, and then you tell me what's wrong. Uh-oh. Yeah. I forgot you're Swedish. You win. Oh, no, <laughs> no, but no, really. the pond is all yours. Oh, you're not going to skate? Well, how big a fool can I make of myself? Oh, please. Well, well okay, now, now, no fancy stuff. No. Just, just skate. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. skate. Of course, I, I used to be a pretty fair hockey player, but... Uh, hockey? Hmm. Oh, you want to play hockey? My brother's... Oh, no, 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 look, just let's skate. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we just skate. <laughs> Making a sound. 
sucker out of him. Look at that girl skate. Poor Glenn. He's trying so hard to show off. I hope he doesn't forget the ice gets awfully thin down to the boathouse. Well, he went through the ice there last year. He couldn't be such a dumbhead as to... Oh, no, no. Get the brandy, Clancy, and the hot water bottles. He did it again. Here's another blanket, Glenn. Still feel cold? Oh, no, 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 not very. My, my, my shoulder's a little stiff, though. You, you drink this, Mr. Morley. Hmm? It's glug. Huh? Oh. Oh, glug. Yeah. Oh, no, not so fast, Mr. Morley. <clears throat> drink it slowly. Oh, so... Yeah. So this is glug, huh? Uh-huh. Well. Uh, Clancy, throw away the hot water bottles. Mm. What about that shoulder? What you need is a good rub down. Yeah, yeah, call the athletic club. Tell them to send a man right over. Oh, there won't be time, Mr. Morley. I- I'll do it myself. Great idea. Now, you lie right down here at the foot of the bed. Now, wait a minute. Now, one pillow here... And this pillow under the chest. Uh, there. Now, we begin. Ooh. Oh, you must relax, Mr. Morley. You are much too tense. Uh, there. That's better. Now, look. Yeah? Is there anything you can't do? Oh, oh yeah. Too many things. Oh, you have three of the most unusual talents I ever heard of. Oh? I'll bet you the... Only girl in Capital City. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. You can give a Swedish massage and bad horses and make glug. Oh, I don't mind that you tease me because I, I, I know how different I am from old Miss Thatcher, for instance. Mm. Would you like to be like Miss Thatcher? Oh, in many ways, yeah. But when I'm around her, I feel strange. I know I talk different from all of you, but around here I talk worst. Why don't you go to college, Katie? And take care of Mrs. Morley at the same time. You could go at night. They have all sorts of courses. Political science. Yeah? Economics. (laughs) The tickles. Hey, hey. Hello, Virginia. Uh, Come in. (laughs) Whatever it is, it looks like fun. (laughs) Tell me, Captain, is this restricted to the family, or do you take outpatients? Well, I, I'd be glad to give you a massage any time, Miss Thatcher. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. You're finished, Mr. Morley. Oh, thank you. Your mother told me you fell through the ice. Yeah, lucky thing Katie was there. No doubt. She saved your life. I'm grateful to you, Captain. Uh, Katie, where are you going? To see your mother. I think I'll give my note just after all, Mr. Morley. No, no, Katie, no. In just a moment, we'll return with Act Two of The Farmer's Daughter. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. What's the picture news tonight, Libby? Well, Metro-Golden-Mayer is certainly starting the year with a bang, Mr. Keeley. Cass Timberlane, adapted from Sinclair Lewis's famous novel, is scoring a hit. It has a remarkable fine cast and tells a love story of real depth and tenderness. And Spencer Tracy is the perfect choice for the title role. It seems to me that Lana Turner gives the best performance of her career as the heroine. There are other distinguished stars in the cast, too. Yes. Yes, the attractive Zachary Scott as the other man and the lovely Margaret Lindsay as the other woman. The glamour department is also well represented, as I think John Kennedy here will agree. With uh, Lana Turner as the leading lady of Cast Timberlane, how could it be otherwise? I'm sure you took particular notice of that lovely luxe complexion of hers in the close-ups, Mr. Kennedy. Well, Libby, Lana Turner is one of Hollywood's outstanding beauties. That peaches and cream complexion of hers is famous. And very sensibly... She gives it daily Lux toilet soap care. Yes, Lana is an enthusiastic Lux fan, I know. As are nine out of ten Hollywood stars. And incidentally, those stars are delighted with the new size of their favorite beauty soap. I mean that wonderful new large bath cake. That bath size Lux toilet soap is making quite a hit in Hollywood, Libby. And with women everywhere who enjoy a beauty bath that's tops in luxury. They're thrilled with the generous creamy lather that leaves skin feeling softer and smoother. The new bath size is the same fragrant white Lux toilet soap, but in a handsome larger cake just right for the bath. The same flower-like perfume and the same creamy rich lather that makes a Lux soap bath a real beauty bath. You'll be delighted with the new bath size Lux toilet soap. Ask for it tomorrow. You'll see it in the familiar sampler wrapper, but in a convenient larger size. Let the whole family enjoy this big bath size Lux toilet soap. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. 
we continue with Act Two of The Farmer's Daughter, starring Loretta Young as Katie Holstrom and Joseph Cotton as Glenn Morley. Glenn Morley went to Europe, and Katie changed her mind. She remains in the Morley household as a maid. For weeks, almost every evening, she's been going to night school. And now, in the Morley Library... Last night, we learned why those nations went off the gold standard, Mr. Clancy. You did, huh? Yeah. Why? Well, it was a move toward the nationalization of the world banking system through the social control of credit policies. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Uh, uh, how's the diction getting along? Oh, that worries me, Mr. Clancy. Tomorrow night, I have to have a speech memorized, and I don't know what to do. A speech, huh? Yeah. Well, come here. Maybe I got one that'll help you. The letters and speeches of Senator Morley. Oh, I'll never forget this one. A lot of speeches had already been made that day. Good speeches, too. Then the senator got up and, uh, well, here, read it, Katie. Today, I don't want to make a speech. I want to tell you a story about a doctor named Sorensen. Dr. Sorensen practiced in the poor section of town where people didn't always have the money to pay. His office was a small room over a livery stable. The shingle over the stable was a simple little sign that read, Dr. Sorensen upstairs. Well, even doctors get sick, and after working years with these poor people, Dr. Sorensen died. And all those people who loved him and whom he loved wanted to put up a fine marble monument, but they just couldn't afford it. So they took the sign from the stable and put it on the doctor's grave. There it stood. And that was his monument. Dr. Sorensen, upstairs. Today, a president has died, but his dream of a League of Nations shall never die. It will live in the hearts of good, common people. For over the president's grave... The people have placed their everlasting monument, which, like the doctors, reads simply, Woodrow Wilson, upstairs. Uh, I'll be glad to loan you that book, Katie. It's mine. Oh, thank you, Mr. Clancy. He must have been a wonderful man, Senator Morley. His son hasn't turned out too bad, either. Uh, he's coming home tonight, Katie. Tonight? Cable just came. You, uh, you'll be leaving us soon, huh? Oh, I have stayed too long already, Mr. Clancy. If I'm ever going to be a nurse... Yeah. Meanwhile, Mrs. Morley's having a party to welcome him home. Oh. Come on. Let's get to work on that silver. Yeah, bar. you bet. Good evening, Miss Thatcher. Hello, Catherine. I know I'm early. Well, is he home yet? Uh, no, Miss. Oh, aren't you wearing your hair differently, Catherine? Uh, I'm glad you noticed. I think I like it better plain. Oh, uh, Mrs. Morley's in her sickie room, if you care to go up. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, good evening. We must see Mrs. Morley right away. It's very urgent. Yes, Mr. Nordic, Mr. Eckers. We'll wait in the library. Oh, gentlemen, such long faces. We have bad news, Mrs. Morley. Poor Wilbur Johnson. Tragedy, a great tragedy. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Uh, Morley. No, no, Katie. I... What happened? When? He dropped dead an hour ago. Dropped dead? Oh, no. Oh, here not. Uh, don't do that. Look, she's fainting. Katie. What on earth? Virginia, we were just talking about Wilbur Johnson. Katie came in to tell me something, and when Mr. Nordick said he dropped dead, Katie fainted. Hi. Glenn. I'll get some water. Welcome home, Glenn. Hey, Clancy. Uh, what's going on here? Come on in, Glenn. Katie. Katie, dear. Uh, hello, Ma. Uh, what's she doing on the floor? She just fainted. I think she thought you were the one who dropped dead. Dropped it? Oh, you mean Johnson. They told me at the airport. Look, she's coming, uh -huh. too. Katie. Katie, are, are you all right? Oh, I'll take care of Mrs. Morley. Come on, Katie. Yeah. You'd better lie down. Telephone the guest, Clancy. The party's off. Well, all in all, quite a homecoming. Give me a kiss. Now, you look fine, Glenn, and I'm fine, so sit down and start thinking. Who's going to take Johnson's place? I guess you'd rather I waited outside. Sorry, Virginia, this, this may take hours. I'll go quietly if you'll give me a scoop on who's replacing Johnson. I think you'll just go quietly. I'll call you first thing in the morning, Virginia. <laughs> you better, darling. Good night, everybody. Yes, good night, Miss Hyde. Good night. It's shameful, good night. gentlemen, that we have to talk politics before Johnson's even buried. But this is going to mean a special election, so we'd better start naming names. Who are we going to run to take Johnson's place? Well, we've been 
at this for two hours, and if you'll still insist that Finley's the best man, all right, I withdraw my objection. Thank you, Mr. Nordic. Well, then that's that. As soon as the governor has announced this special election, we'll call a mass meeting and introduce Finley as our candidate. And now let's have dinner. Well, Katie, is that you? Yeah, I did. Oh, come here. I want to talk to you. Oh, I, I thought you were very busy working. I am. Uh, been ice skating lately? Uh, no. I tried it once in Switzerland. It wasn't much fun. Uh, I tried it too, but I, I kept looking around for you to fall through the ice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought a lot about you while I was away. I. Uh, we we thought a lot about you too, Mister Morley. Katie, I. Yeah. I uh, I, I was watching you at dinner. Uh. uh Apparently, uh, you don't approve our choice of Mr. Finley. Well, I, I I don't think he's much an improvement over Mr. Johnson. Well, what do you know about Finley, anyway? Well, I, I know his record, and it's a very bad record. So you're an authority on Mr. Finley, too. Oh, well, for one thing, now, why did he stop free milk in the grade schools? Well, if you don't like him, don't vote oh, for him. Oh, don't worry, I won't. I was only asking you, why did he stop the free milk? Don't ask me. Ask Finley. There'll be a big mass meeting soon. Ask him. He'll be there. All right, I will. Well, uh, all right. Sorry, I, 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 I didn't mean to upset you. Upset me? <laughs> I'm not upset. Good night, Mr. Morley. Good night. What are they yelling about, Mr. Clancy? Haven't you ever been to a political rally before? They'll yell at anything. Listen. Fish for sale! See what I mean? Oh, no. Well, they'd better start quieting down. The boss is going to introduce your pal, Ladies Finley. and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. It's now my privilege to introduce your next speaker. Your former alderman. Your former commissioner. Your next congressman from the 13th District, Anders J. Finley. I don't know how much more of this I can stand. But, Mr. Morley... Why does he have to have a part of all of this? He doesn't like it any more than we do, but things like this bring in the boats. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, there have been a lot of speeches made here tonight. I'm going to make mine very short. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate the magnificent tributes paid me by our wonderful leaders, Alfred T. Eckers and Orlando Nordic. And all I've got to say is that my platform is my record, and I stand on my record. Thank you. Thank you. And now, if there are any questions anyone would like to ask, I'll be very glad to answer them. I have a question. Katie. Yeah, the little lady down there has a question. My question is, why are you running for Congress? Oh, brother. Uh, now, wait a minute. Let the little lady talk. Uh, why do you ask that question, miss? Uh, because I'd like to know how you, with your record, can ask these people to vote for you. I'll match my record with any man! Oh, no. No, this record that Mr. Finley will match with any man's is as follows. In 1930, Alderman Finley's brother-in-law, Oscar Nordstrom started getting the snow cleaning contract and received it every year that Mr. Finley sat on the council. In 1932, Alderman Finley said that bread lines were costing the city too much money. And he even introduced a bill to force apple sellers to buy licenses. And if that isn't enough, in 1933, Mr. Anders J. Finley, in his speech at Lincoln Heights School, told the parents... at a political rally held tonight in behalf of Anders J. Finley. Introduced by Congressman Morley, Mr. Finley... Should I turn the radio off? No. But we've heard the same thing on two other news broadcasts already. Katie, to hear it again. I've been checking on her identity, and this beautiful blonde is employed as a maid in Congressman Morley's home. She couldn't have been more of a bombshell if she'd been planted there by the opposition party. Oh, was she? Well, where are you? Neither Mr. Nordic nor Mr. Eckert... I've been thinking, Mr. Morley, ever since I got home. I better turn this off. I'll leave here tonight. Leave here? Well, that's great. 
You know what they'll say about me then, don't you? No, what? They'll say I threw you out. They'll say I'm against freedom of speech. Right. They'll... I need an aspirin. Better do as he says, Katie. Just keep your mouth shut until this election's in the bag. Yeah, all right, Mr. Clancy. I will. Well, Katie, you know who that was you were just talking to on the telephone? He said his name is Mr. Hughes. That's right, Mr. Hughes. Well, why do you look at me like that? If you didn't want me to talk to him, why did you call me to the phone? What did he want? He wants me to come to his office this afternoon. Who is he, Mr. Clancy? Merely the head of the opposition party, that's all. The opposition party? But he's a good man. If he wants to see you, well, go ahead. But what would he want to see me about? It's hard to read the mind of an honest politician. I don't know. Well, that's the situation. I phoned Katie Holstrom, and she's here in the outer office now, waiting to see us. Well, sure. bring her in. Now, I don't know anything about this girl, except what she did to Finley last night. But sometimes, if you're lucky, you can put over a freak. Well, she's wholesome looking for the women. The serving girl and it is the labor vote. She's corn fed for the farmers. Swedish for the foreign born. What have we got to lose? Well, shall we give her the pitch? Sure. Right. Okay. okay. Yes, Mr. Hughes. Send in Miss Holstrom. Come in, Miss Holstrom. Thank you. I'd like you to meet Mrs. Ford. How do you do? Mr. Jackson. How are you? Mr. Raines. How do you? Mr. Collins. How do you do? I won't waste your time, Miss Holstrom. We've been talking things over, and our party simply doesn't have a candidate strong enough to beat Anders J. Finley. At that rally last night, you were pretty positive about what kind of a congressman you didn't want. We're hoping you'd be just as positive as to what kind you did want. Oh, well... What I think doesn't matter so much. But uh, I feel what is needed is a man to represent all of us. And not just the people who oh, raised the money that helped him in his campaign. He, he should know what all the people want and vote for what they want. Thank you, Miss Holstrom, for giving us our candidate. You run, of course. What? You run for office. Be our candidate. Me? Oh, Harold, Jude, what have I done? What have I done? My taxi is here now, Mrs. Morley, so I want to say goodbye. You're really going to go through with this? I have to. I don't let her do it, Ma. She won't listen to me. How can I stop her if that's what she wants to do? Why, it's ridiculous. Here's a, a girl. Catherine Holstrom. Catherine Holstrom, right. A bunch of opportunities. Give her some song and dance about being able to elect her to Congress. Uh-huh. Why, she doesn't know the first thing about politics. Uh-huh. I ask you, how can she be expected to sound off on such things as a minimum wage bill, a full employment bill, a permanent FEPC, atomic bomb control, a, oh, a hundred other things? Can you? Well, that's beside the point. I'm already a congressman. Oh, go on, Glenn. Well, what right is she to run anyhow? Ma, you've got to stop her. We have no right to stop her. Katie, you stop running for Congress. I give up. My dear, I don't think you're remotely qualified either. And I mean to use every device in my power to defeat you. But goodbye, Katie, dear. And good luck. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. Clancy! She's leaving. Oh, Mr. Clancy's waiting at the cab. Goodbye. Oh, it's a rotten shame to take a nice girl like that and toss her in a den of lions. Your concern wouldn't be because you're in love with her, would it? Of course I'm not. It's, uh... Just that she's a very sweet girl and uh, fair play and... Uh... Well, it's none of my business, but she's worth a dozen Virginias. Of course she is. Why, a girl like that, in love with her, me? I don't know. I don't know why I'm crying, Mr. Glenn. Because you can't bear to say goodbye to me. Yeah. I guess that must be it. I'm going to let you in on something, Katie. It might bring you luck. What? For over 30 years, I've been voting the Morley ticket. This time, I'm going to vote for you. Oh, Mr. Clancy. But that's really not a change, because in my book, you're Morley people. Go ahead, driver. (laughs) We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of The Farmer's Daughter. It's a special pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, the lovely young actress, Miss Nancy Coleman. 
Let me congratulate you, Nancy, on your role in one of the important films of the year. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. You can imagine how delighted I was to be given a featured part in RKO's Morning Becomes Electra. Not only because it's a great drama, but because of the stars. Rosin Russell, Michael Redgrave, and Leo Genn. It was a privilege to work with them all. I think everyone agrees Rosalind has the greatest role of her career in Morning Becomes Electra. Yes. She herself told me she felt it's by far the most challenging role she's ever done. During the 18 months it took to complete the picture, I got to know her very well, and what a grand person she is. Yes, Rosalind is much admired in Hollywood. Everyone at the studio adores her. She's so good-looking and always so perfectly groomed. Her dressing table is a miracle of neatness. You know, I noticed one shelf in her cupboard is especially reserved for a supply of... <laughs> well, get, guess what, Mr. Kennedy? Well, knowing that Rosalind Russell has been a luxe girl for years, I'm sure she always has plenty of her favorite beauty soap on hand. Yes. She never neglects her daily Lux soap complexion care. And that's a wise beauty rule for any girl to follow. I know I find it so. I wish our audience could see that lovely Lux complexion of yours, Miss Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I've always been a Lux girl. And now Lux toilet soap keeps my skin the way I want it for camera close-up. Have you used the new bath size cake, Miss Coleman? Oh, yes, and it's wonderful. Makes my Lux soap beauty bath more luxurious than ever. Luxury is what it's been designed for. The new bath cake is the same fine white Lux toilet soap in a big, generous size that gives lots of the rich, creamy Lux soap lather fastidious women love. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss Nancy Coleman, and a wonderful New Year to you. And here's a New Year's suggestion to women everywhere. When you go shopping... Be sure to buy the new bath size Lux Toilet Soap in the familiar sampler wrapper. Enjoy its delightful clinging fragrance, the extra luxury it gives to your bath. The whole family will enjoy it, too. We return you now to William Keeley. Time now for the third act of The Farmer's Daughter, starring Loretta Young as Katie Holstrom and Joseph Cotton as Glenn Morley. Several weeks ago, Katie Holstrom came to Capital City to become a nurse. Instead, she became a maid. And now, overnight, she's turned into a candidate for Congress. Her political backers have furnished her with a suite of rooms in the Capital City Hotel. And there, with her brothers, Katie rehearses a campaign speech. And only in cooperation with the rest of the world can we achieve a lasting and happy peace. If elected... I shall work for the rights of all people, no matter what their color or religion, and support every measure that advances those rights. I thank you. Well, boys, well, well, it's too loud, right? Catherine. Must you yell like that? But the diction teacher says I must project my voice. How can I project my voice Catherine. if I don't? You come in. Hello, Katie. Mr. Morley. Well, I'm on my way to Washington. I just thought I'd drop by. Oh. I, I, I've been practicing a speech. Yes, I, I was listening in the car to... Oh. Uh, these are my brothers. Congressman Morley. This is Peter. Hello, Mr. Peter. And, and Sven. Nice to meet you, sir. And Olaf. How do you do? Oh. Uh, did you like my speech, Mr. Morley? Well, I'm hardly in a position... No, no, sir. go ahead. Tell us. We want to know what you think. I did it exactly as the diction teacher told me. Then the first thing to do is... Fire the diction yeah. teacher. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What did I tell you? It isn't the speech, Kate. It's just the way he's making you say it. I, I think it's ridiculous. That's what I've been telling you for three days, Catherine. So you're, you're going to Washington. I came to say goodbye because at the house I didn't say goodbye the way I wanted to. Oh, thank you, Mr. Morley. Good luck, Katie. Every kind of good luck. Congressman, wait. Tell Catherine what she is doing wrong in her speech. Oh, now, Olaf, Mr. Morley has to catch a train. Well, but I... she needs your help. Well, look, Katie, I, I saw you at the rally. You spoke simply and honestly about how you felt. And that's the way you've got to talk through the entire campaign. You can't win by yelling and waving your hands. You've got to talk like... Well, uh, Clancy told me how well you read one of my father's speeches. You talk like that, Katie. Just, just be yourself. Let's start the speech again. And now? Oh. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I want to ask you for the most precious thing you own, your vote. That's it. That's the way to do it. This right to vote is something that you must cherish and guard with courage and dignity. When someone asks you for your vote, you must be jealous of that vote. You must ask yourself, who is it that I'm voting for? What does he stand for? And what does he believe in? Nothing wrong can happen to you, the people, 
if you will use your vote properly. And no man... Go on, Katie. Say it. And no man or group of men can hurt you if you will use your power of a free and honest election. Katie for Congress. She's from the people. She's for the people. Paul for Finley. Experience, foresight, integrity. Capital City Evening News. Forecast poll of special election. Brandis J. Finley, 84%. Katie Holstrom, 16%. Come on in, Eckers. What's the matter? Well, Nordic, did you see the evening news? Two weeks ago, Finley was walking away with that public opinion poll. Well, look at this. Hmm. Finley, 52%. Katie Holstrom, 48%. Hmm. What's happening to those people? Have they gone nuts? With our machine and all the money we've spent, Finley ought to be at least 80%. Do you realize it's just two days before election? Uh, what did Mrs. Morley say about Glenn? He's due back from Washington first thing tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh come in, come in, Miss Morley. Hello, Finley. Uh, we were just talking about Glenn. We can count on Glenn for four speeches, and we'll put him on the radio tomorrow night. Well, Finley? He's got to get in there and slug. Not that I'm exactly worried, but that Holstrom girl has been getting away with murder. Excuse me, Mr. Nordick. Well? There's a man here to see you. He says it's very confidential. All right, send him in. Go right in, Mr. Berger. Well, how do you do? Well, you want to see me? If you're the boss... He's the boss. Now, who are you? My name is Adolf Berger. It's okay if I talk in front of everybody, Mr. Nordick? Go ahead, talk. Well, there's some talk going around that Katie's going to run away with the election. Katie? You know her? I'm the one that brought her to Capital City last November. Oh? Friend of the family? I know the Holstom's all right. I'm a traveling painter, see? I paint barns, houses, fences. Get to the point. Well, I'm here in the interest of good American citizenship. And I don't think that a girl of Katie's character should be allowed to run for Congress. What's that? I got some pretty personal information, see? About a night she spent in the motel when, due to circumstances... you think Katie should not be allowed to run for Congress. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. What's your point in telling us this? Well, like I told you, good citizenship. I suppose you expect some expression of our gratitude. Oh, no, ma'am. Although things have been kind of rugged lately, I could get a hold of a few hundred dollars... What and... kind of a campaign do you think we're conducting? Get out of here, Berger, before I throw you out. I can prove everything I say. Get I... out of here. Okay, if that's what you want. I just thought you wanted to win this election. But he said he had proof. What goes on around here? Are we for me or are we for Katie? I haven't quite made up my mind, Mr. Finley. Well, that may be funny to you, Mrs. Morley, but I've spent 20 years of my life in politics. I can match that and add 20. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I know if it weren't for your backing, I'd really be a dead duck. Well, if it's all right with you, I'll drop over to see Glenn first thing in the morning. We'll all be over in the morning. Without Glenn's help now, we're sunk. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, please. Now, Virginia, what were you saying? That I think you're being very foolish, Glenn. Don't you realize that this story of Berger's would cinch the election for Mr. Finley? You bet it would. Oh, I don't know what you're all talking about. Nordic, didn't you just tell me you threw Berger out of the office? Well, yes, yes, I did. But Mr. The... Finley, however, happened to run into Berger last night. Why beat around the bush? I went after Berger, and I'm glad I did. Look at these signed statements. The mechanic who fixed his car, the woman who runs the motel. Sworn statements, Glenn. Hey, you've been... Busy as little beavers, haven't you? Now, just a minute, Glenn. This is a hot story, and I work for a newspaper. It's loaded with enough dynamite to blast that cheap no account. Shut up, We've got to be practical, Glenn. In politics, you use every break you can Virginia, get. Virginia, don't print that story about Katie. Why, Glenn, I seem to remember you on the platform saying, quote, I'll fight for free speech and freedom of the press. And I remember that the polls open tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. As things stand now, it's a 50-50 bet we're going to get our ears pinned back. Mrs. Morley, will you please ask your son, do we want to win this election or not? I must assume that Berger's information is correct, Glenn. And I suppose we have to win an election. I'm phoning this story to my office. If that story's printed, I quit the party. Well, I... I hate to think of a Morley leaving the party, Glenn. When your father died, it was a little tough for us for a while. We made it all right. I guess we can make it again. Then if you'll excuse me, I, I need some fresh air. Call your paper, Miss Hatcher. It can print everything. Expo, Expo, house painter Miss Katie and starting expose. Candidate Katie refuses to talk, cancels speeches, and leaves town. Finley's election assured a scandal hits Katie. All I want from you, Mr. Hughes, is to find out where Katie is. I've got to see her. Congratulations, Morley. Where did she go? This is a rotten way to win an election. 
Even if it's true, you shouldn't have done it. What do you mean, even if it's true? You know exactly what I mean. Anyway, she and her brothers have gone back to their farm. I think that's all I wanted to know. Katie. Katie, say something, won't you? You, you can feed the chickens later. Katie, look, I, I saw your brothers. I tried to talk to them. They walked away from me, too. You don't think I... I believe what was in the newspaper. You don't think I'd stay with a party that would countenance a thing like that, do you? I've quit the party. That's what I've come to tell you. Well, that's all I wanted to say. No, it... It, it isn't all. I'm in love with you. You, I love you so much. Katie. Oh, darling. I... <laughs> How would you like to come to Washington with me? You'll be the happiest girl who never got elected to Congress. <laughs> of course, darling, of course. Mm. Uh, Glenn, uh, Pop is old-fashioned. You'll have to ask him, too. Sure. I'll ask him. <laughs> Where's the kitty? Where's Pop? Important, Catherine? I'm trying to plow. It's important, Papa. This is Glenn Morley. Yeah, I know from your picture, Mr. Morley. Now, Mr. Holstrom, I want you to know I had nothing to do with what was in the paper about Katie. Yeah, I know from your picture. It is sad this had to happen, sad for Catherine and sad for the people that love her. I know how they feel. I love her, too. We want to be married, Papa. And you come for my permission? Yeah. Did you come for my permission when you ran away from Capital City? I told you before. You told but... me lots of things. You asked me nothing. You want her to quit, too, Mr. Morley? I thought it would be the easiest thing for Katie. Yeah, the easiest thing. So you want to get married. Well, go ahead. I don't care whether you get married or not. Are you trying to make me feel ashamed, Papa? Yeah, but ashamed only for quitting. If you want to be in Congress, then you must oh, fight. How can she fight the kind of lies they've been printing about her? He's right, Papa. I don't care what it says in the papers or anywhere else. Woman or man, if you don't want to fight for truth, then you shouldn't be in Congress. Will you help me fight, Glenn? Oh, you bet I will. Oh, darling. <laughs> you know, Mr. Holstrom, I, I wish I had you for my campaign manager. <laughs> Good. I think you make fine son-in-law. I hope so. I know so. From your picture. Hello? Glenn, where on earth are you? Yo, what? I suppose you think that comes as a big surprise to me. They're going to get married, Clancy. It's okay. I approve. <laughs> what? No, but I wish you hadn't walked out quite so fast this morning. I have a very interesting guest here. Never mind who. Just stay where you are and wait till I call you back. Yes, very soon, I hope. Interesting guest. You may not know it, Mrs. Morley, but Anders J. Finley is drunk. I better take him home. You stay just where you are. A couple of more drinks, and maybe I can give Glenn a wedding present. Excellent, Dickie, Mrs. Morley, excellent. I'm glad you like it. And don't think I'm not flattered. Just you and I chatting socially in your home. Well, it's the least I can do, Mr. Finley. <laughs> You've been of great service to the party. But I'm worried. But the election's in the bag now. I'm worried about all that money you must have paid Adolf Berger. Ah. I think the party should reimburse you. Well, I wouldn't hear of it. What's $3,000? $3,000, eh? $3,000 to Berger, 500 each to the mechanic in the motel, lady. You don't <laughs> say. Uh, surely you're not going to turn Berger loose with all that money. Hmm? Well, he <laughs> might get drunk and start talking how he invented the whole story. Oh, not little Adolf. I've got him in protective custody until after election. <laughs> in a safe place, I hope. In my lodge up at Kaloom Lake. I got a couple of my toughest boys guarding him. Your boys? Mm-hmm. You have your own machine, Mr. Finley? Oh, it's a national organization the boys and I belong to. Mm. We've got to stay in the cover for a while, but we've got a great plan mapped out to educate the people. Oh, how nice. One hundred percent Americanism. Oh, yes. No foreigners. Mm. The right kind of religion. Right, right. Oh, I guess I know where you stand, Mrs. Morley. <laughs> I think that's about all I wanted to hear, Mr. Finley. Huh? All right, Clancy, you can throw him out now, right on his 100% American ear. Hello? 
Hello, Ma. We're at Kaluma Lake. Did you get Adolf? You bet we did. Quite a brawl while it lasted, Ma. Well, tell me about it. I wouldn't know. I tripped over a stump and knocked myself out. That's my boy, all right. Katie and her brothers got him. We'll be home in a couple of hours. Better have Nordic at the house. I may have a statement to make. Night, Glenn. The pool's open in seven hours. Get on it right away, Nordic. There's still time. I'll stick by the party only if we dump Finley and say so publicly. Impossible. Call the newspapers. They've put out extras for less reason than this. Issue a statement in support of Katie and get it on the radio, too. But you can't tell All them. All of this must be done by seven o'clock. But, but you heard what the man said, Mr. Nordic. Now get going. Yes, Mrs. Morley. Extra, extra. Finley's party throws him out. Nordic edges all bonus to back Katie. Holds through. Danger can pass Finley Pride, both parties endorse Katie. And speaking to you from his room in the hospital, here is Adolf Berger. I lied, and I'm sorry I lied. Everything I said about Katie is a lie. Mr. Finley gave me $2,000 to lie about Katie. You have placed in me a great trust and a great confidence. I am very grateful. I promise I will do everything in my power to fulfill that trust. Well, there it is, Katie. The capital of the United States. Sometimes I wonder, Glenn. Maybe I should have stayed at home and been a nurse after all. (laughs) If you ask me, our party can use a good nurse, too. (laughs) Come on, Katie. We don't want to be late for your first session. Glenn, I... I just go in? Uh, what is customary? Oh, I'm not quite sure of the protocol in a case like this. I, I'll just carry you across the threshold and see what happens. Uh, now, darling, uh-huh. uh, we went skating. You fell through the ice, remember? Uh-huh. And when we went after Mr. Berger, you knocked yourself out, huh? Uh-huh. Well, I think it's safer if I just walk in. <laughs> So Katie goes to Congress, and our thanks go to tonight's delightful stars, who've helped us start the new year so auspiciously, Loretta Young and Joseph Cotton, who returned to the footlights in response to your applause. Loretta, we're happy to have you back from London in time for tonight's performance. Oh, thank you, Bill. You and Sam Goldwyn must must feel pretty proud, Loretta, to have to have had your picture, The Bishop's Wife, selected for London's command performance. Indeed. Not to mention receiving the congratulations of the king and queen. Oh, it was a thrill, all right. But except for that, our trip was pretty sobering. How do you mean, sobering? Well, Joe, you have to experience the shortage of food in England to realize how desperate their situation is. I can readily understand your donating the food you bought for you and your husband. Well, unfortunately, it was so little. But we were told it helped prolong the lives of ten people for six months. Well, it looks as if the best way we can wish our European friends a happy new year to send them every bit of food we possibly can spare. Well, that's our resolution for 1948, Joe. And a very splendid one. Have you made any other New Year's resolutions, Loretta? Well, a few, Bill. But there's one thing that doesn't need a resolution, and that's to continue using Lux soap faithfully for my complexion. And I can see by the evidence in front of me, you'll really keep it. Well, thank you. What's following the farmer's daughter on this stage next Monday night, Bill? Next week, from my home studio, 20th Century Fox, we bring our audience a punch-packed melodrama that equals in excitement anything I've ever seen. It's Kiss of Death with its original outstanding stars, Victor Mature, Colleen Gray, and that unusual new personality, Richard Widmark. That ought to keep your listeners rooted in suspense, Bill. We'll be listening. Good night. Good Good night night. and best wishes for the new year. (laughs) Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Victor Mature, Colleen Gray, and Richard Widmark in Kiss of Death. This is William Keeley saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. Here's a New Year's resolution we hope every housewife will make. To save and turn in every drop of used fat during 1948. The need is still great because world production of fats and oils is still far below requirements. So it's up to the kitchens of America to make up the deficit. It can be done easily if we all do our share. Many stores are now paying higher prices for used fats, so turn in a tin as soon as it's filled. 
your dealer will pay you for every pound. Joseph Cotton appeared by arrangement with David O. Selznick, producer of Alfred Hitchcock's The Paradine Case. Heard in our cast tonight were Janet Scott as Mrs. Morley, Cliff Clark as Clancy, Bill Johnstone as Finley, Francis Robinson as Virginia, and Robert Griffin, Leo Cleary, Herbert Rawlinson, Norman Field, Lois Corbett, Herbert Butterfield, Ira Grossell, Clark Gordon, George Neese, June Whitley, Stanley Farrar, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our men and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Kiss of Death with Victor Mature, Colleen Gray, and Richard Widmark. Epsident won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Kiss of Death with Victor Mature, Colleen Gray, and Richard Widmark. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.